Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for your uh, interest in uh, Abiona. And um, as a start, let me just start by um, telling you what, uh, what is special about our company. So um, from inception, Abiona was started by 12 patient advocacy foundations. So if you think about uh, patient centricity, if you think about perseverance, if you think about passion for finding a cure, those are all integral part of, uh, of our company. We've, uh, we've evolved and we have three programs in clinical development that I will um, tell you a little bit more about. We've opened our GMP facility this year. And we also have an AAV next generation platform, which we think is gonna be a significant advantage for our company that I'll also um, touch on in this uh, presentation. So this is our pipeline, and it spans gene and cell therapy. We're multiple modality. I'll spend most of the time on the late stage um, clinical programs, but I do want to point out that uh, for infantile um, Batten's disease and also juvenile Batten's disease, and, and those are fatal uh, neurogenitive disorders, we've made some significant advances, and we expect to have an IND in infantile Batten's disease by year end or the beginning of uh, next year and also in CLN3 uh, in uh, 2019. So I, we're, we're pretty excited about that. Um, so <clears throat> now starting with um, uh, our EB101 program, this is for rece recessive dystrophic EB. As you can see, we have a whole host of regulatory designations, so six regulatory designations, and the ones that are most um, important are RMAT and breakthrough therapy. And these not only will accelerate our time to get to market, but they give us um, a significant amount of interaction with the FDA. And it's been a very um, constructive, um, collaborative um, process. So recessive dystrophic um, EB. Yeah, I can see some people kind of shaking their heads. Um, the picture of the patient really only starts to illustrate how devastating this disease is. Um, these patients, unfortunately, are missing the ability to produce collagen 7, and so therefore their skin is not anchored to the underlying dermis, and their, their skin is as fragile as butterfly wings. And so the onset of this disease in the, is in the first decade, um, and you can see from, from this patient um, you know, the impact. So they live with chronic wounds, and you can also think about fluid loss, um, the risk of infection, the social stigma of having to live uh, with this kind of a disease. And you actually would never see a patient like this. This is a patient that's being seen by a physician because they live their life um, completely uh, bandaged. And in fact, even as a caregiver, you know, you can kind of think about um, what, it, what it means to take care of a child like this um, and bathe them uh, daily with, um, with water that's diluted with bleach to try and stave off infection. These patients um, um, typically live um, to their uh, 20s and 30s. There is no FDA-approved um, treatment uh, today, and we've conducted a phase one, two clinical study that I'll show you some results, and we're now preparing for a phase three. As part of um, understanding the disease and also as part of our regulatory process, we did a uh, natural history study and, uh, and, and basically reviewed 128 um, uh, our dead patients, and we 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 found uh, more than 1,400 uh, wounds. Two third of the wounds are uh, recurrent wounds. One third of the wounds are actually chronic wounds, and you can see a large portion of these wounds are have been open for more than um, seven years. Uh, the um, what we also know from the chronic uh, from the uh, natural history study is that uh, the uh, traditional skin grafts have been tried. There have been 15 attempts to try traditional skin grafts, but none of them have worked. And again, because here the underlying deficiency is the collagen 7 gene, this is an inherited disorder, so there isn't the ability, again, to bind the skin to the underlying dermis. Okay, now I'm going to start showing you uh, some data out of our, oh, I'm sorry, so let me talk about the product first, and then I'll get to, I want to jump right into the data. So here on the left is, um, is our product, um, EB101, and that that picture uh, depicts the development and the delivery of the product. So it starts with a skin biopsy of the patient, and we isolate keratinocytes from that biopsy, and then we transfect uh, the uh, keratinocytes with a retrovirus uh, and basically insert the collagen 7 gene. 
Now, this is important because um, this is a permanent insertion of the collagen uh, 7 gene into the, uh, into the cells. We then um, grow the cells into sheets, and that picture on the top right is basically a layer of skin that's about four cells deep um, that after it's been grown for, about, uh, for close to a month. And then we apply the skin uh, on a petroleum gauze and staple it there for stability. And then, and then that, that, that uh, picture on the bottom right is basically the product. And that's what's actually then um, actually transplanted on, on the patient. So here is, I'm going to start with the clinical data by showing you some pictures, and then I'll show you some actual data. So the pictures um, on that top left uh, reflect a wound that's been treated. So uh, at baseline, and then if you fast forward to 24 months um, after the, uh, the graft procedure, and you can see that you have, after 24 months, um, healthy skin. And it truly is healthy skin, um, because when we look at the collagen 7 expression in that uh, histogram, uh, in the immunofluorescence pictures there, it, at baseline you can see no green line, and that means that there's no collagen 7. And then you can see basically sustained collagen 7 throughout the 24-month um, period. And we also see the same with the anchoring fibrils. Um, those are also detected uh, as three months and then all the way out to 24 months. And we actually now have a patient that's out um, three years. This is what the actual data uh, itself looks like. So we treated uh, 42 wounds, and uh, we had at three months uh, a 100% um, uh, basically wound closure rate, and that's compared to 0% control. Uh, that was a, uh, you can see that the numbers drop off just with the number of patients that we've been able to follow over time, but if you look at six months, we basically maintain a 90% a wound healing rate uh, compared to 0% on the control side and close to that in, uh, at 24 months. And like I said, we have now one patient that is out three years, and they have all six, um, uh, uh, skin, uh, all six wounds that are closed and been healed. Um, beyond the wound healing, what you also see is from the patient reported outcomes, um, pain and itch, a significant reduction in pain and itch. And I, I should have mentioned that these patients also live with a significant amount of pain, um, not being able to sleep at night, if you think about just having chronic open wounds, and also the itching from the wounds continually uh, closing. Um, and what we see is a dramatic reduction in pain um, to z going to zero at 12 months. And then some of the itching remains, and that still is re relative to the, basically the, the healing process um, of the grafts. So we were pretty excited about um, that data, um, and so was the FDA. Um, after seven patients, the FDA basically said, okay, we want to move now to um, a phase three program. And basically the next steps with the EB101 program is are that we have a phase three protocol, and actually we feel very, really good with the phase three protocol. There have been no questions from the FDA on the protocol itself. It's very consistent with actually guidelines that the FDA um, published around uh, EB uh, clinical trials. And then right now we're working through the, uh, basically the CMC work um, to enact the, uh, the phase three program. So, uh, so now I'll move to uh, MPS3, um, and we have uh, two programs, ABO102 and ABO101. Uh, ABO102 is non-intuitively for MPS3A, and ABO101 is for, th uh, for MPS3B. So MPS, um, and you can see also we have a host of um, uh, uh, regulatory designation, including the RMAT designation. And, um, you know, MPS3 is, is somewhat the last of the Mohicans um, within the MPS world. All of the other MPS disorders, now one through seven, have some type of treatment, but MPS still remains an unmet medical need. Uh, with no treatment. And um, the uh, San Filippo, the normal cell, you can see the big difference between the normal cell and, and then the cell with a lysosome deficiency. What we're talking here w about MPS is basically a buildup within the lysosome of toxic sugars. And um, within the um, if MPS3A and 3B, the, the lion's share of the patients are MPS3A patients. Uh, and um, here the, the disease um, the onset of the disease is at birth. Um, the first um, signs or symptoms are kind of coarse facial features of, of the child. Typically, that's missed. Um, then there are um, speech delays. 
Um, typically, the patients are seen for speech delays, but not necessarily diagnosed um, because kids mature at different times around speech. The really challenging thing around MPS is that these kids um, never cognitively develop beyond three years of age, irrespective of uh, their actual age. So by the time, they, and in fact, after three years of age, their cognitive function starts to regress to about one year old, to about one. Right now, the average delay in diagnosis is one and a half to nine years. So unfortunately, right now with an MPS, you know, this is, this is a disease that's not being captured very, very early. And many of the patients, by the time that they're actually diagnosed, there's been irreparable um, brain damage that, that, that's, that's, that's happened. Um, the, uh, so as, as I mentioned, no treatments approved to date. Uh, and we have two ongoing clinical trials. And just like in RDEB, we also have a supportive natural history study that goes across uh, 3A, 3B with the same type of endpoints that we're studying in our clinical trials. Now, since we only have 15 minutes, I'm, only, I'm quickly going through this. Um, a number of the ABO uh, team is here. And if there's any other additional questions, always feel free to, to, to get us um, as, you know, here at the conference. So um, right now, we're uh, enrolling into our third cohort. So we've enrolled the first two cohorts of this study. Uh, we're two patients away from enrolling our third cohort. And we believe that we will uh, be, we'll complete that cohort by, uh, by year end. Um, the primary objective of the study is safety, but um, consistent with uh, regulatory guidance, we have a number of endpoints uh, to measure biopotency, biophysical impact, and also neurocognitive um, impact. And I'll, I'll show you, uh, and I should also mention that we're doing this study um, internationally. So we have Nationwide Children's, we have um, uh, an Australia Women and Children's in Adelaide, and we also have a hospital uh, in uh, Santiago de Compostela in Spain where we're conducting these clinical, these studies. Um, so I'll show you, I'll just show you a couple of the highlights. Um, heparin sulfate is, is the kind of toxic sugar that builds up, and you can see here a dose dependent very dramatic response in heparin sulfate. Um, that reduction of 83% that we're seeing in the third cohort six months out, um, there's never been any other treatment that's shown that type of, um, that type of reduction of um, heparin sulfate. Um, as, as you would expect, uh, if you're reducing the heparin sulfate, the, the lysosomes are storing and, and engorging with, with heparin sulfate. There's, you know, there's a large concentration in the liver. These patients have very enlarged livers. On average, these patients have 2.2 2 .2 times the uh, normal uh, liver size. And what we see is a, uh, a dramatic reduction in, in liver volume, uh, where we see uh, liver volume going down to you know, 1.2 to about 1.4, uh, depending on the cohort that, um, 1.2 uh, of normal depending on the cohort of the study. On the neurocognitive side, um, so this is still, very, still uh, pretty early data. In the first cohort, and this is the first uh, three patients, we saw a pretty um, a marked um, difference between the, uh, what we saw in the natural history study and what we saw in the treated patients. We also have data um, that we presented on the second cohort. We're starting to see some patient, interpatient um, variability. We now have data in the second cohort out to a year. Uh, and like I said, we're now close to um, basically filling our third cohort. And I should mention that in our third cohort, based on the regulatory guidance, we've actually focused on enrolling very, very young patients. Because we actually want to um, intervene with gene therapy before the irreparable um, brain damages happen. And so the, we've gotten approval to go down as, to as low as six months. The challenge there is, is being able to identify those patients. But we have, um, we've been able to enroll um, very, very young patients. And so we're really excited also to see um, how that data um, uh, matures and, and we'll be um, presenting as it, as it matures. So on the 3B program, uh, we, right now we have um, only one site nationwide that is, um, that is enrolling, and we only have one patient in this trial. But we're, we're going to include, uh, we're going to increase the number of sites fivefold. So we've just approved um, a, uh, the hospital in Spain to now enroll in 3B, and we will also be um, starting centers uh, additionally in Europe. Okay, so I mentioned on the next generation AAV uh, vector platform, and I'll quickly touch on that. 
I don't know if you guys saw today that um, there were three scientists that actually got the Nobel Prize um, for directed evolution. This is basically a directed evolution approach um, for um, AAV vector development. And it's basically looking to optimize um, AAV beyond the natural wild type for tissue tropism. And so we now have uh, more than 60 capsids that we have, um, that we basically have evolved and we screen out for tissue tropism. And, and uh, we, we think that there's gonna be some significant advantages here because you can think about there, there will not be any immunogenicity to these novel um, um, capsids, and as well as uh, the, the ability to more finely target um, uh, tissues, targeted tissues. Okay, I'm almost, uh, so, so this is my last slide, and I can't believe it's a build slide. <laughs> so it's missing most of the builds. <laughs> is there a way that you can, uh, there it is. Okay, so just in the last couple seconds here, I'm just gonna highlight um, some of the upcoming milestones. Um, I mentioned that our manufacturing facility is open, and in fact, it's now working at full capacity in support of our clinical trials. As we look forward to um, the rest of this year and the beginning of next year, uh, we're preparing for the phase three trial in uh, EB101. Uh, uh, we, again, on uh, ABO 102 and MPS 3A, we will complete the enrollment and we'll start to uh, continue to share the data. We're working co very collaboratively both with the EMA and um, the FDA um, on that program. Uh, EB ABO 101, we're gonna um, increase the number of sites so that we can enroll more patients. And then uh, I mentioned that we are uh, also enthused about um, um, the CLN1 progress that we're making and expect an IND submission. Uh, as well as proof of concept data around this, uh, uh, our AIM uh, vector platform. So um, that's it. Thank you for your attention and your interest, and thank you very much.